Salam Program Malaysia. Hello and good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brendan Lapal and you're watching News at 10. Our top stories tonight. Cabinet forms special task force on jihad against inflation. And third COVID-19 vaccine dose for immunocompromised kids and teens. Muslims in Malaysia will celebrate Hari Raya Idul Adha on 10th July. Assistant Secretary of Rulers Conference Muhammad Asral Jusman said this in an announcement broadcast over RTM earlier tonight. Bagi menyempurnakan titah perintah Sri Paduka Baginda Yang di Tuan Agong setelah diperkenankan oleh duli-duli yang maha mulia raja-raja maka saya bagi pihak penyimpan moho besar Raja-Raja Malaysia dengan ini mengistiharkan bahawa 1 Zulhijjah 1443 Hijrah ialah pada hari Jumaat 1 hari bulan Julai 2022 Masihi. Oleh yang demikian, Hari Raya Kurban 10 Zulhijjah bagi negeri-negeri seluruh Malaysia ialah pada hari Ahad 10 hari bulan Julai 2022 Masihi. The cabinet today agreed to form a special task force on jihad against inflation to help Malaysian families face the rising cost of living. Prime Minister Dr. Sri Ismail Sabri Yaakob in a statement today said the main role of the special task force is to gather all information from ministries, agencies and the public. In addition, the Special Task Force will also formulate strategies and coordinate actions to resolve issues relating to inflation, especially in controlling price hikes more efficiently and effectively. According to Dr. Sri Masabri, the task force will have meetings twice a week, namely on Mondays and Thursdays. He said the move was taken following the rising cost of living faced by the people due to climate change and geopolitical uncertainties. The Special Task Force on Jihad Against Inflation will be chaired by Minister of Communications and Multimedia, Tansri Anwar Musa. It will have five members, namely Minister of Finance, Tengku Datu Sri Zafrul, Tengku Abdul Aziz, Minister of Agriculture and Food Industries, Datu Sri Dr. Ronald Kiandi, Minister of Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs, Datu Sri Alexander Nantalingi. Minister of the Prime Minister's Department Economy, Datu Sri Mustafa Muhammad, and Chief Secretary to the Government, Tan Sri Muhammad Zuki Ali. The Prime Minister said an officer will be appointed at each ministry as the focal point to provide immediate responses to the Special Task Force with KBD and HEP as its Secretariat. The new ceiling price of standard chicken has been set at 9 ringgit and 40 cent per kilogram. In a statement today, the Agriculture and Food Industries Minister, Dr. Sri Dr. Ronald Kiani, said the cabinet also decided that the retail price of grade A X will be set at 45 cent each, grade B at 43 cent, and grade C at 41 cent. The new prices will take effect on Friday. The ceiling price for standard chicken was previously set at 8 ringgit and 90 cent per kg in Peninsula Malaysia and was slated to be removed on 1st July. Dr. Sri Dr. Kiandi said the decision was taken by the cabinet after taking into account the Bantuan Keluarga Malaysia BKM announced by Prime Minister Dr. Sri Masab Yaakob where cash aid of 500 ringgit will be given to eligible B40 and M40 groups. According to him, some 8.6 million BKM recipients have been approved so far and they are slated to receive up to 2,600 ringgit in aid this year alone. The minister also said the government had allocated 369.5 million ringgit for this cash aid, bringing the total amount spent on subsidies to 1.1 billion ringgit since the 5th of February. 
Moderate or severely immunocompromised children and adolescents aged 5 to 17 will be given the third dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. Health Minister Kyrie Jamaluddin said children between 5 to 11 that had been certified as immunocompromised category by medical experts from both public and private sector are eligible to take the third dose eight weeks after their second dose. According to Kyrie, those who are 12 to 17 years old and immunocompromised can get the third dose 28 days after their second dose. Immunocompromised youth aged 12 to 17 are also eligible to get their first booster dose three months after their third dose. A second booster will also be offered to at-risk individuals aged between 18 to 59 years old and frontline health workers. This will be given at least six months after receiving the first booster and after consultation with any registered medical practitioner. Kyrie also said that the Cancino vaccine will be used as a heterologous booster for all adults regardless of the type of primary dose vaccine. Those who are eligible for the Cancino booster dose are individuals aged 18 years and older who have received a primary dose of the COVID-19 vaccine other than Cancino and Sinovac. Meanwhile, the Health Ministry says it has revised the procedure for funeral rites of COVID-19 victims. According to MOH, Muslim rites are in line with the resolutions of the Muzakara Committee of the National Council of Islamic Religious Affairs. The latest procedure would allow trained mortuary attendants in hospitals to bathe and shroud the remains. However, the attendants are required to wear personal protective equipment, PPE, before handling the remains. Only two fully vaccinated family members of the deceased in PPE are allowed to participate in the burial of the last rites. The ministry advised that aerosol generating procedure, AGP, such as the gently compressing the stomach of the deceased, should be avoided. MOH said for non-Muslim deceased, if the last rites require changing the attire for the deceased, the attire must be placed on the remains without involving AGP. However, the ministry stated in a statement today, the remains of each COVID-19 victim will be released in a single body bag instead of using two body bags previously. The ministry also said there are no longer limits to the number of family members attending the funeral. However, all those involved in the burial process must be in PPE, while other attendees at the funeral must wear face masks and avoid overcrowding. MOH also received a total of 528 complaints on illegal dental practitioners throughout the country from 2017 to 2021. Its Senior Director, Dental Health, Dr. Normi Othman said of these complaints, 377 or 71.4% involved fake braces, 58 cases on dental veneers, crowns, and 93 on dentures, tooth extraction, and teeth whitening. She said the number of complaints rose between 2017 and 2019, but decreased during the 2020-2021 period. The drop might be due to increasing public awareness of bogus dentists or enforcement of the Movement Control Order, PKP, which restricted their activities. However, Dr. Normie expressed her concerns that the transition to the endemic phase will see their activities rising again. She said most of the fake dentists were women, aged 20 to 30, and they were locals and non-citizens. Dr. Normie said MOH also believed that some of the bogus dentists also made their clients sign an agreement not to disclose their treatments. Therefore, she urged those who had signed such a contract to come forward with information to facilitate MOH in investigation and promise to protect their identities of those willing to come forward. In other news, Selangor has recorded losses amounting to 59.6 million ringgit in online fraud cases during the first six months of this year. Selangor Police Chief Dato Arjunaidi Mohammed said it involved 1,354 cases, which accounted for 75% of the total commercial cases in the state, with the Macau scam recording the highest number of online fraud. 
He said, based on police investigation, most of the 59.6 million ringgit has been transferred abroad and caused losses to the country's economy. Dato Arjunaidi said for the period between January and June this year, more than 1,700 individuals had been detained for their role as mule account owners. He said it was due to the modus operandi of using mule accounts that made it difficult for the police to prove the involvement of real criminals behind the scam. He said the existing law under Section 420 of the Penal Code, namely fraud, needed to be amended so that it would be in line with the growing technology as it did not meet the current situation with the online banking and money transfer system. Kelantan police arrested three men with 252,000 Yaba pills worth 2.52 million ringgit, seized in two separate raids in Kota Baru and Bacho on Monday. Kelantan Acting Police Chief Datuk Muhammad Zaki Harun said the first raid was carried out at the parking lot of a restaurant in Kampung Jalujo, Bangu at 3 p.m., which led to the arrest of three local men aged between 27 and 33. In the raid, he said police approached two suspects in a Honda Jazz car who at the time were dealing with a 33-year-old man who was astride a Honda Icon motorcycle. In the search of the vehicle, police found 14 plastic packages which contain 84,000 Yaba pills which can supply the entire Kelantan market. Dr. Mohamed Zaki said the arrests led to a second raid on the house of one of the suspects in Kampung Takang near Tawang in Bacho which yielded 168,000 Yaba pills, worth 1.68 million ringgit. He said the three suspects are being remanded for seven days from 28 June to the 4th of July for further investigation under Section 39B of the Dangerous Drugs Act 1952, adding that two of the suspects tested positive for methamphetamine, while one of them had a record of drug abuse. Yet to come, MCMC approves DG Cellcom merger. Stay with us. But first, former Deputy Prime Minister Dato Sri Dr. Ahmad Zahid Hamidi today told the High Court that all corruption, criminal breach of trust CBT, and money laundering charges made against him were politically motivated. He said it was something that he and several other politicians in the country had to face. Dr. Sri Dr. Ahmad Zahid said this when being cross-examined by Deputy Public Prosecutor DPP Dr. Raja Rosella Rajatoran in his defence trial against 47 charges, 12 of which were of CBT, 8 of corruption and 27 of money laundering involving tens of millions of ringgit belonging to Yayasan Akalbudi. The trial before Justice Dr. Colin Lawrence Aquera continues tomorrow. Over to the north, a 74-year-old man was charged in separate sessions court in Butterworth, Pulau Pinang today with 17 counts of raping and sexually assaulting two sisters between 2014 and 2021. Ashari Ibrahim, who taught the two girls, now aged 13 and 11, to read the Quran, pleaded not guilty to all the charges. He was not allowed bail and the courts set 29 July for mention for appointment of counsel and submission of documents. And in the East Coast, a lorry driver pleaded guilty at the Pasi Mas Sessions Court in Kelantan today to two charges of injuring his wife and mother-in-law using a knife. One Mohammed Hafizuddin, one Ismail, 27, was charged with voluntarily causing hurt to Nick Salma Johnny, 26, and Tuan Aziza Tuan Bongsu, 61, at a house near Kampung Chabang Empat Tumpat at 5.30pm on 21st June. He was charged under Section 324 of the Penal Code, read together with Section 326A and Section 326 of the Penal Code. Magistrate Mustakim Sukarno fixed the 5th of September for sentencing.
The Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission, MCMC, has approved the proposed merger between DG.com Berhad, DG, and Cellcom Axiata Berhad, Cellcom. As DG and Cellcom are respectively Malaysia's second and third largest mobile service operators to date, the merger will result in the formation of the country's largest mobile service operator. The MCMC in a statement released today said that it had conducted a thorough assessment on the merger. On 1st of April this year, the Commission issued a statement of issues to DG and Cellcom in accordance with the merger guidelines for the set application of merger and acquisition dated 17 May 2019. The measure was taken to address concerns that the merger would significantly reduce competition. In response, the applicants had submitted an undertaking containing their commitment to addressing the competition issues highlighted by the MCMC in the Statement of Issues. The MCMC further said it had considered the commitment offered by the applicants and is satisfied that it will significantly reduce the competition issues that will or may arise as a result of the merger. Previously, in April last year, Axiata and Telenor Group announced that they were discussing the proposed merger between Salcom and DG to form a new entity known as Mergeco and that it was expected to be completed in the second half of 2022. The participation of the Malaysian delegation at the world's largest international film market, Marche du Film, in Cannes, France, last month yielded great results with overall sales value of 158.7 million ringgit recorded, far exceeding the target of 50 million ringgit. Communications and Multimedia Minister Tan Sri Anwar Musa in a statement said that the figure includes potential sales and deals that have been finalised. The minister said this proves that the local creative industry has its own market niche if all parties work together to increase Malaysia's visibility at the global level. Mars du Film is the film industry's largest gathering for producers, financiers, broadcasters, distributors, suppliers and buyers from around the world to meet, share ideas and make deals. A total of 250 companies from 110 countries participated in the nine-day event from 17 to 25th May. Tan Sri Adwa said at the film market, the government and 13 local companies, including film producers, production service providers, filming facility supervisors and animation companies showcase their products and services with world-leading companies and bodies such as Warner Brothers, Sony Pictures, Netflix, BBC and Canal Plus. All this is said proof that the government is very supportive and fully committed in developing Malaysia's creative industry ecosystem at the international level. The Raja of Perlis, Tuanku Said Sirajuddin Putra Jamalulail, today chaired the 259th meeting of the Conference of Rulers at Istana, Negara. Before the meeting started at 11 a.m., Tuanku Said Sirajuddin took the salute at a Grand Guard of Honor, KKU, mounted by the 1st Battalion of the Royal Malay Regiment at the palace's main square. <laughs> Tuan Ku Said Sirajuddin then planted a Korean tree on the grounds of Istana Negara to symbolize his chairing of the meeting. Yang Di Petuan Agong Al Sultan Abdullah Riyaduddin Al Mustafa Bila Shah also graced the tree planting ceremony. The two day meeting is being attended by all Malay rulers except Kelantan, Pahang, and Johor. Also in attendance are the Yang Di Petua Negeri of Penang, Malacca, Sabah and Sarawak. All the Malay rulers are accompanied by the respective Menteri Besar, while the Yang Di Petua Negeri are accompanied by the respective Chief Ministers, except for Sarawak, who was accompanied by the Deputy Premier. The last meeting of the Conference of Rulers was held on the 9th and 10th of March, chaired by the Sultan of Trangganu, Sultan Mizan Zainal Abidin. 
Rising squash player Aifa Asman has been chosen as Malaysia's Jalo Gemilang Barrow at the 2022 Birmingham Commonwealth Games, replacing S. Siva Sangari, who is hospitalised following injuries she suffered in a road accident on Sunday. The 20-year-old Aifa takes on the responsibility along with powerlifting champion Bonnie Bunya Gustin at the Games in Birmingham, England from 28 July to the 8th of August. The Olympic Council of Malaysia, OCM, in a statement today said the decision was made by its selection committee, chaired by OCM President Tan Sri Mohammad Noza Zakaria. Aifa, ranked 28 in the world and winner of the 2021 Malaysian Open, will compete in the women's singles and doubles with Rachel Arnold in her second appearance in the Commonwealth Games this time. At the 2018 edition at Gold Coast Australia, Aifa participated in the women's singles and mixed doubles with Sanjay Singh as a partner. The Kedah born player had won a bronze medal in the women's team event at the 2018 Jakarta Palembang Asian Games and a gold medal in the same event at the 2017 KLC Games. OCM had initially named national number one Siva Sangari, 23, along with Bonnie Bunya, who is a Paralympic and world champion, as the national flag bearers. However, Siva Sangari, the world number 19 and a gold medal prospect in Birmingham, has to miss out on the action at the Commonwealth Games as she is expected to need at least three months to fully recover before being able to return to the court. That concludes this evening's news at 10. There are top story, Cabinet forms special task force on jihad against inflation. Join us again at 12.30 tomorrow afternoon at the Dennis Lights Out. I'm Brenda Lepal. Stay tuned to Saloran Barita, RTM, Salam Kogablesia. And have a pleasant evening.